Hello, everyone. My name is Fazal Rizvi. I'm an emeritus professor at the University of Melbourne and at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. So I assume I work uh, in this sense transnationally. Uh, and the topic of my lecture today is transnationality, but in ways that I hope uh, will be new to you. And I will not be repeating things that you have already heard. Uh, I'm very pleased to have been given this opportunity to, to record this lecture, and I hope it works uh, as well as uh, uh, the hosts uh, have expected um, it to do. So, and I hope it is useful to you. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is uh, commodification and how the commodification of international higher education has been achieved and how it has become the dominant paradigm within the framework of which we have begun to think about internationalization. I then want to look at some of its consequences and how it has actually marginalized yet other equally important and perhaps pedagogically and morally more robust forms of internationalization. So I want to approach this topic from the perspective of critical internationalization, but I hope from a slightly different perspective to the one that you are already familiar with. So what I want to say, and what I want to begin say, is, to, is uh, with the idea that uh, there is absolutely nothing new about internationalization of higher education, both normatively as well as descriptively in terms of a description of the set of practices, it is quite old. Scholars and students have always traveled long distances to attend ancient and medieval centers of higher learning to share and develop new knowledge. Indeed, there is nothing new about uh, the global mobility or transnational and transcultural mobility of students and scholars. Uh, they've always done so. And as a result, ancient academies always hosted and housed a large number of people who were not local, but had traveled long distances to attend the, the classes that were taught and uh, the knowledge that was shared. Now, in my view, I actually put the point a little more strongly than that. I argue that any new knowledge was invariably and has always invariably been a product of a scholarly exchange. In other words, transnationalization of knowledge creation has always been part and parcel of the notions of the production of new knowledge. In areas such as astronomy, algebra, and the sciences, it was largely as a result of the mobility of students and scholars and uh, uh, epistemic exchange that new knowledge was produced. Uh, algebra came from Middle East. Uh, many of the sciences came from China and astronomy came from India. And as a result, uh, uh, it was as a result of the exchange of uh, knowledge traditions uh, that uh, we had the opportunity of creating knowledge. To what extent that is still the case, of course, is something that is open to discussion. But it is certainly true that without some form of internationalization, new knowledge would be much more difficult to achieve. And as a result, uh, the ancient academies in India and Middle East and North, of, uh, North uh, Africa, uh, from places like Nandala, from Baghdad, from uh, Benghazi, Fez, Cairo, all of these places has had ancient academies that deliberately invited people from Europe in order to participate in knowledge exchange and knowledge creation. And uh, as a result, many of these academies were often regarded as centers of intercultural exchange and intercultural learning. In other words, I want to actually uh, uh, say to you that uh, the idea of internationalization of the production of knowledge is nothing new. It is as old as ancient academies of learning, higher learning themselves. Now, just as the ancient academies in India and the Middle East and, uh, and in Asia and North, Af uh, North Af Africa hosted scholars from uh, Europe, so in turn did the academies in Europe, uh, Bologna, Oxford, um, places like that, Paris, hosted scholars and students from other parts of the world. 
In other words, there was a huge amount of movement of knowledge as well as bodies, as well as scholars themselves. Uh, I always think about the example of uh, the Fibonacci sequence, uh, which is a sequence that is of considerable importance in mathematics, uh, 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 which uh, became known as Fibonacci sequence, uh, but had existed in uh, various other parts of the world, to which Fibonacci, the Italian mathematician and trader, traveled and uh, brought back the knowledge of, uh, uh, we call them Fibonacci, but the idea is much older than the Fibonacci sequence, uh, um, sequence describes. Fibonacci sequence is in fact produced as a result of adding the last two numbers to, to produce the next one. So for example, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, uh, 5, et cetera, et cetera. So basically you add the last two numbers in order to produce this was incredibly useful in the development of all kinds of sciences and in understanding of uh, nature and the regularity in nature. So as a result, what, you, uh, what, what, you, what, what I'm saying to you is an example of how um, intercultural exchange um, and inter-epistemic exchange has always been central to the production of new knowledge production of innovation and all those sort of things. So when people talk about how globalization has given rise to these possibilities, they're forgetting a very important history that predates what we now call globalization. At the same time, from the very beginning, there were normative ideas of cosmopolitanism that can be found in most knowledge, cultural and religious traditions. Uh, now, the word cosmopolitan itself, uh, we ascribe to the Greeks, the Stoics in particular. But you know, there are other traditions that also had some version of the idea of cosmopolitanism. So although they may not have used the term cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism as a phenomenon is not all that new, and it can be found in most traditions. Uh, it is a normative idea, it is an aspiration, so it doesn't describe what is happening, but it does actually aspire to a particular notion of common humanity, humanity's interconnectedness and interdependentness. This might appear like a, like a romantic idea, but it certainly was an aspiration that was long proposed by philosophers and kings alike. Uh, the people, uh, ordinary philosophers actually uh, proposed this particular view as a way of uh, thinking how the uh, cultural distinctions and cultural differences were in fact arbitrary and that we all belonged to a common humanity, if you like, a universal humanity. And uh, that, uh, that that notion was may not be practiced as such, but is well worth aspiring to. Um, let me give you an example or two that might be useful to show how non-Western traditions uh, uh, spouse certain normative ideas of cosmopolitanism. In the Chinese tradition, in the Ch there's been a concept uh, called Xinxia, uh, which suggests a global ethics based on human heartedness. And the term for human heartedness in Mandarin is Ren. So Ren produced uh, uh, for uh, this idea of Ren basically implied that people had a certain desire, certain capacity to connect up with other people who were radically different uh, and that this particular idea should be the basis upon which we develop a, a global ethics. A, an ethics that is not parochial does not only imply to, implies to your own traditions, to your own family and to your own community, but, in, uh, but uh, refers to uh, and, uh, and incorporates uh, the humanity as a whole. Um, and the notion of human heartedness is a disposition that people have that, uh, that can be exercised in developing the global ethics that the Chinese held very dearly for centuries, for centuries. And indeed the idea is quite uh, uh, often uh, presented in the tradition of Confucian thinking. Similar aspirations of human heartedness, if you like, of, or cosmopolitanism can be found in Buddhism and Islam and Hinduism. Um, uh, all of these traditions have uh, sp scholars who actually debated amongst themselves uh, as to whether ethics was particular or whether it was universal. And if it were universal, then we needed to actually figure out uh, 
how we can bring those people who do not agree with that universality into our fold. So as a result, uh, there was always an interest uh, in certain kind of cosmopolitanism. So although the expressions of cosmopolitanism varied, um, the normative idea or normative aspiration of cosmopolitanism has always existed. And as a result, um, I want to say again, that some of the ideas that we have learned in recent years in relation to cosmopolitanism are not new. Uh, although their forms are particular to particular traditions, the ways in which they were exercised or articulated varies, but uh, the core of the idea is roughly centered around the notion of human right, uh, heartedness or the notion of common humanity or hu humanity's interconnectedness or interdependence. Of course, in ways that are different, but nonetheless, I think you can actually argue that uh, cosmopolitanism is not necessarily a Western concept, but has elements of it that can be found in other traditions as well. Now, with colonialism emerged a very different kind of uh, uh, internationalization, if you like, or very different way of thinking about interconnectedness and interdependence, not no longer in normative terms, in terms of uh, philosophical aspirations, but in terms of uh, something that was linked to the imperatives of commerce and the desire to exploit local resources of lands far away. So the British, the French, the Dutch, the Portuguese, uh, to lesser extent German, went far and wide seeking where they could find resources that they could exploit it in order to enrich themselves. And that was the basic uh, motivation behind colonialism. But uh, colonialism also demanded that uh, they see the world as interconnected. In other words, the commerce in India was not disconnected from commerce in the uh, United Kingdom, for example, or in, you know, or in, uh, or in Europe, uh, European countries. So as a result, uh, countries like United States, uh, United Kingdom and India became very closely connected. So under colonialism, a very different kind of internationalization emerged. And this internationalization was predicated on the assumptions of commercial uh, or, uh, or resource exploitation. Uh, in other words, uh, it was no longer in normative assumptions of uh, the world being human hearted as the Chinese called it, or um, a common humanity. So these people saw common, uh, humanity as differentiated, but differentiated in such a way as uh, to assume that the colonial powers, the colonizers stood way ahead of the colonized. They were considered superior. They, they, they were considered the, having the kind of intellectual, moral, and, uh, and, and, and economic security that allowed them to see interconnection in terms of, um, in terms of commercial, commercialism and in terms of uh, colonization. Now, at the same time, the colonial system of education was developed uh, through which subjects, the colonial subjects, loyal to colonial interest could be developed. Why was this necessary? Well, this was necessary as a way of finding people who were locally located, but whose interests were linked to the interest of the colonizers. So for example, an Indian army had to be created that was loyal to the crown, the British crown, rather than to some distinctively local set of, uh, of, of institutions. Uh, um, in other words, uh, uh, the, some kind of uh, local subjects had to be developed who did not regard their own cultures and their own traditions as inherently better or even equal, but inferior, inferior in some way, so that uh, uh, the, they, 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 they demanded, they desired uh, those things that the colonizers had. In that sense, what we had is an institutionalization of colonial privilege or white privilege to use the more contemporary term in which uh, it was assumed that the privileges of uh, certain nations of the European communities, the colonizers could not be objected to or could not be challenged. And education became located within this board logic uh, 
Okay. In other words, uh, well, universities were created in the colonies um, so that uh, people, uh, colonial subjects loyal to the colonial interest could be developed. Uh, so universities in India, the country that I know the best, uh, universities of Calcutta, uh, to Madras, and uh, and 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 Mumbai or Bombay were created in uh, 18 early 1850s uh, as a way of uh, developing a, a set of uh, people indian people who were educated within the mores and with the traditions intellectual as well as others as well as the moral traditions of uh, of of uh, of the rulers in other words uh, the idea was that the local people will become like uh, uh, like uh, like the colonizers, they will have similar kind of taste, similar kind of attitudes, and similar kind of dis dispositions. So as a result, these institutions were quite deliberately created to have a colonial curriculum, and that curriculum was largely designed to develop colonial attitudes, colonial dispositions, and colonial taste. Of course, some very able students, local students, were sent off to the leading European universities, such as, um, such, as, such as Oxford and Cambridge and Paris uh, and so on, uh, to learn and to become modernized so in their dispositions, in their skills, attitudes, and cultural taste uh, in such a way as to be useful to the colonial rulers. So what we have is a very asymmetrical system in which every effort is may, being made to create a system of higher education, if you like, a system of global interconnectivity and interdependence uh, in favor of the colonizers and against the interest of the local populations. Uh, uh, and this is where the idea of modernization and the modernization uh, goals of European, European style universities was uh, articulated. So universities were seen as modernizing institutions. Modernizing in terms of what? In terms of uh, European traditions, European attitudes, and uh, European cultural taste. So let me tell you that uh, at the University of Mumbai and uh, the other two universities in India and other universities in other parts of the world too, the, of the British Empire, the subjects that were most notable in their presence were administration, often and law, often British law and, and British administration, mathematics, and of course, uh, the whole thing about English literature. Uh, Macaulay, who wrote quite extensively about, uh, about uh, what kind of education should uh, India have, was very explicit in his uh, assertion that uh, uh, in order to develop a colonial system of education, higher education, uh, not only did the colonial powers have to develop modernist European dispositions, but they also had to destroy what had existed as educational traditions in the past. In other words, uh, uh, colonization was always about creating something, but destroying something at the same time, destroying the academic traditions that had existed in places like India and, uh, and, and other places, but in, um, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, et cetera, but also creating a new one, replacing them if you like. You know. And one of the things that uh, Macaulay was very keen on uh, that uh, colonial students or uh, uh, colonial subjects should learn was to read English literature. Why English literature? Because English literature, it demonstrated to them the value of English manners now, if you look at English literature of the 17th and 18th and 19th century, much of it is about manners and learning of manners. You look at Jane Austen, you look at Hardy, you look at even somebody as late as Charles Dickens. They were always highly normative uh, stories, normative on how to be a modern citizen or how to be a civilized citizens. And Macaulay had no doubt that these novels, were these literatures, were most useful to actually develop these modernist uh, European dispositions. So you can see that the colonial uh, authorities were trying to develop an interconnected system of higher education within which uh, certain colonial dispositions were prepared. So interconnectivity is not new. 
interconnectivity happened before, but happened through the lens of colonial predicates or colonial ideas or colonial assumptions. Uh, so you can see that interconnectedness or global interconnectedness is not new, but was framed uh, within the within the through the, with the through the prism of colonial interest. Um, now, when colon the, the assumptions of what this is called colonial modernity, uh, colonialism mixed with modernity um, persisted even after the colonizers left. So, in a, in 1947. India got independence. Many of the African countries were given their independence in the 1950s and 60s and even to the 70s. But interesting enough, the, the assumptions of colonial modernity had been well and truly entrenched in those countries and those spaces. And, uh, and, and even after these nations got their independence, they were not entirely independent. As scholars like, uh, as theorists like Franz Fanon pointed out in his book, Black Faces, White Masks, uh, he argued very clearly that uh, the nationalist leaders who had fought so strongly for independence continue to imbibe and continue to express and privilege, if you like, uh, colonial sentiments and colonial ideas. Uh, in other words, just because people were no longer colonial, did not mean that colonialism had disappeared or colonialism had vanished. And indeed, some of these ideas of colonial modernity persist to this day. And even the current system of higher education incorporates many of these ideas of colonial modernity as scholars like Sharon Stein and Vanessa Andriotti and many, many others have pointed out. Um, now, so basically what happened after the after the after independence was many of the countries like india and like pakistan like uh, hong kong and singapore um, there emerged a, a a nationalist ruling class that could not imagine higher education and educational uh, generally in ways that were no different to the ways in which uh, uh, they had been trained into the colonized tradition so although there were some attempts made to decolonize the curriculum, the curriculum was left relatively un untouched. Um, and that has remained to this, uh, to this day the case. And hence, we are still, still struggling uh, towards an agenda of decolonization, uh, largely because the, the, the nationalist leader failed to deliver a decolonization when these countries were first uh, when they first acquired independence, uh, and as a result, perhaps decolonization is going to be an ongoing project, a political project that may last for decades still going forward, uh, and that it is not one soft thing, but it's a process that will will need to continue to. To, to, to argue for and try to implement, uh, uh, because as soon as we have uh, uh, decolonized some aspect of education, we notice how other aspects of uh, higher education or education generally have also need to be decolonized. In other words, we keep on discovering new aspects of decolonization in a whole range of interesting ways. So, okay, at, this, at the same time, the economically rich countries like Britain, United States, uh, Australia, Canada, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, felt that they had an obligation to provide education aid in an effort to develop education and uh, develop knowledge and skills needed for curriculum development. Now, colonization had left many of these countries destitute, and it's of course an interesting question as to why it is that they didn't invest in education to the extent that they should have, or how infrastructure that was inherited by independent country was as poor as it was. So for example, in, for example, in India, um, the percentage of people who were literate was no more than 7% in 1947 when the British left. And uh, of course, it's a damning comment on the British colonialism that they did very little to educate uh, the local populations. Um, and in that sense, they were a kind of a, uh, they, they were 
they, they practiced in what I call extractive uh, colonization. In other words, through the post, post through the colonization, they didn't invest in the country. They simply extracted value from it. Uh, but after independence, they feel felt that they needed to provide some kind of development assistance or aid, if you like, to help these countries in their aspirations of economic and social development. And as a result, uh, um, various uh, uh, various scholarship uh, uh, schemes emerged. Uh, so, such as the Colombo plan or Fulbright plan or European plans of various kinds, uh, similar kind, and also the plans by, by Soviet Union, where countries from the poorer country, uh, uh, students from poorer countries were, uh, were given a place at, uh, at leading universities in Europe and, uh, and in the United States and in Russia uh, to come and develop their skills. Of course, many of these students did not go back home, but nonetheless, they were educated in the skills and knowledges of the, of the kind that again privileged the Western, Western traditions. Uh, in other words, development itself was done with, through the prism of, uh, 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 of colonial modernity. Uh, and as a result, this form of developmentalism was really in the interest of uh, uh, commercial interest of uh, uh, the previous, the colonies, uh, the, the colonial powers rather than the colonies themselves. Uh, so although individuals benefited from these scholarships, countries did not necessarily be benefit whole, whole amount. At the same time, the motivations of these countries in providing aid, educational aid, were very complicated and were embedded within the machination of the Cold War. So just as a uh, United States and uh, Britain and France uh, gave scholarships uh, to a whole range of students uh, from India and places like that, from Caribbean countries and places like that. So did Soviet Union gave scholarships to Indian students as well and to students from Cuba and Venezuela and Brazil and, and Argentina. Uh, so basically education became or higher education in particular became a kind of like a, a tug of war within the Cold War as a, uh, with the with Soviet bloc inviting international students to train these people in dispositions that were favorable to their side, the socialist side and uh, the Americans through Fulbright scheme and the Colombo plan and all those other schemes tried to pull towards uh, uh, and try to achieve the loyalty of these students, uh, uh, their gr gratitude towards of these students towards their side. So what we have is a really, really interesting way in which uh, in which Cold War became, if you like, the temp the framework within which internationalization of thought about. So what I have tried to do through this historical journey. And before I come to the con contemporary, I want to sum up by saying that this historical journey, this historical account, if you like, shows how internationalization of higher education is not new. But the motivations, the rationale, the motives, the interest that draw into particular forms of uh, internationalization have varied all the, o o over the years, from colonialism to post-colonialism to Cold War politics, and now to a different kind of internationalization. So to understand internationalization historically, we must see how interconnectedness and interdependence uh, um, across the national and cultural boundaries, those ideas have always been with us, but they have been articulated and expressed very differently. And what I want to show is that in the last four decades, we have got another new, form of internationalization. And that's actually what is now the dominant uh, way of thinking about internationalization. Now I will stop the, the sharing for a little while and then come back to you as I clear my throat and have a drink and come back and do the second half of this lecture where I talk about the more contemporary aspects of uh, internationalization of higher education and how they build upon the older traditions, but actually give them a new form and new set of expressions, uh, uh, new, new kinds of historical dis uh, conjunctions, if you like.
let's uh, get back to what I was talking about. Um, what I've been saying so far in this lecture is that uh, there is nothing new about uh, the idea of global interconnectedness and indeed internationalization of education. It has been valued for centuries, but its form and its practices and its justifications have changed over the years. So while in the medieval period, the interest was largely in uh, intercultural uh, learning and exchange and production of new knowledge, during the colonial period, international connectedness in education, in the higher education, become associated with the processes of uh, colonization and the need to produce through education, colonial subjects who were, set, who were somewhat uh, sympathetic and who uh, supported the colonial interest of the colonizing power. Now, uh, in, the, in the more recent years, it has been associated with the uh, developmentalist ideas, post-colonial developmentist ideas, which retained some of the assumptions of colonial modernity, and of course, uh, the Cold War as well. That actually, that geopolitics shaped international uh, connectedness in a particular way. Now, what has happened since the 1980s is that a new discourse of internationalization has emerged. And this is, discourse is best seen as something that is linked, but not the same thing as the processes of globalization. It recognizes that globalization exists and that the world as a result of developments in uh, technologies and as a result of the collapse of the Soviet, uh, Soviet bloc uh, is likely to become more integrated than ever before. And that this is an opportunity for those who, uh, who, who believe in uh, uh, capital, uh, global capitalism, uh, this is an opportunity for them to rethink every aspect of uh, human life and make it subjected to the logic of the markets. So it doesn't matter what aspect you look at, everything it is assumed is potentially subjected to, can be subjected to uh, market logic, energy, transport, uh, travel, um, et cetera and higher education. So in that sense, I think what I have done over the years is seen the new discourse of internationalization uh, emerging in 1980s as both an expression of and response to the processes of globalization. And of course, what has happened is uh, that as a result of globalization, higher education institutions always constrained by the declining public funds for their operations and with the, the desire to expand and grow, they have seen international education as a source of additional revenue or income, if you like. So this response to the global processes, the processes of globalization has now become dominant. Viewed in terms of a neoliberal imaginary, it is regarded as an opportunity for the commercialization of educational services. So what I'm arguing here is uh, commercialization has not emerged out of nowhere. It has emerged out of a recognition of the possibilities of globalization as conceived in the 1980s uh, in uh, market terms, in terms uh, that uh, uh, sh uh, assume that market considerations can be applied to everything, including those things that were once uh, largely in the sphere of public goods rather than private goods. So this view of the relationship between globalization and internationalization is what I argue that has become hegemonic. In other words, I am not collapsing the ideas of globalization into internationalization and seeing them as interchangeable. I'm saying that it's useful to see them as different and see international higher education as a response to the opportunities especially commercial opportunities that globalization has opened up. Not its problems, but its, its opportunity. And of course, this view of uh, the relationship between globalization and internationalization has been relentlessly promoted by international organizations, the corporate sector and systems of higher education, but in ways that are slightly different. 
the IGOs, the inter, inter, intergovernmental organizations, have promoted it because they have been keen. And some of them have always been associated with the market rationality. So for example, the World Bank and, uh, and, 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 uh, and OECD have always seen education in human capital terms. And they have, they have used the opportunity opened up by an understanding of globalization to promote its view of education as basically an investment in human resource development. Like in other words, in your own capital so that eventually you will benefit from it through higher wages and so on. And this logic has been applied to nations as well. If the nations spend money or if the corporations spend money, then they're like on education, then they're likely to derive certain benefits. So, and of course, once this logic becomes established, then what you see is governments slowly pulling back from education because they think that either the individuals can invest in their own education, or if the corporate sector is so interested, then they can support it too. So as a result, what we have seen is more and more governments seeing alternative sources of revenue for higher education as a really very attractive proposition. Now the corporate sector have viewed internationalization as slightly differently. They have said that they need certain kind of workers, certain kind of graduates who are adept at working in the global economy, who are, if you like, global market, who can operate the global markets, who are comfortable working internationally as their production sites become diver diversified and as their activities span the, 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 the international uh, space rather than remain within a country or within a locality. So they're seeing education, uh, higher education, and internationalization of education as an opportunity to produce certain kinds of certain kinds of citizens, citizens who are comfortable and who are supportive of market rationality. And as a result, business schools have preached for quite some time now supply side economic, neoliberal economics, if you like. Uh, if you look at the courses in business schools, the assumptions of neoliberal, the neoliberal economics are not even questioned anymore. They are simply taken for granted. And it's the mechanics of how you translate those ideas into specific practices that is now investigated. So you can see that international organizations are ideologically committed, whereas corporate sector are instrumentally concerned with having certain kinds of, uh, some certain kind of graduates who are helpful to globalization, to, to their efforts to participate in global, global economies. Now, system of higher education, of course, have seen it as a way of filling the revenue gap so that uh, the money that is declining from universities can actually be, be made up by students paying fees. And of course, this allows them to develop into, uh, to, to initiate certain capital projects and expand. They can, their prestige and their, and, and, their, and their growth becomes dependent on this new source of revenue. So what you're seeing is the relationship between globalization and internationalization differently positioned, but overlapping, okay? They're not completely separate. Similar kind of discourses can be found in each of those areas, but you can see that the promotion is done for, from different motivational perspectives. And as a result, what you have is a very kind of overlapping, but relatively coherent language uh, of uh, international in of higher internationalization of higher education, which is now viewed as an export industry that is subject to ex exchange value, as Marx uh, uh, put it, uh, subject to buying and selling. In other words, uh, it is no longer seen as a public good necessarily, but also a private good in which you can invest and from which you can derive considerable monetary and other, uh, other, other, other benefits of various kinds. So as a result, what we are seeing is the emergence of an industry around these ideas. And industry is something that has its own rules, that it has its own, own norms and its own organizational practices. So what we've seen in the last 30 to 40 years 
is the emergence of these new rules and these norms and these organizational practices. That's what makes them acquire the character of an industry. So now, increasingly, people talk about international education as an industry. Now, when they talk about it industry, they're not really interested in, if you like, the content of education. They're much more interested in, if you like, its organizational practices of selling and buying. Okay, that's what makes it into an export industry as opposed to something that is rethinking the nature of educational practices or pedagogy or curriculum or assessment or whatever, okay? So that's not what they're concerned with. The industry part is largely made up of that professional field that is, that is linked to the exchange value rather than the value in itself, rather than its use value, if you like, um, its exchange value that is being highlighted. So what are the aspects of this industry? Now, remember, I'm saying that industry is uh, that uh, set of practices that uh, make it into a coherent kind of activity, coherent kind of institutional practice, if you like. Well, the first thing is that over the last 30 years, and in new administrative technology has been developed for international student recruitment. In other words, there are various rules of how you go about recruiting, how you offer places, how you justify credit transfer and all those sort of things. And that requires a specialized knowledge. And these professionals that have emerged to do that work know that work quite well and quite often have taken charge of it. So quite often it's not the academics who are making judgments as to whether somebody is qualified for admissions. It is all, it's, it's, it's those people who practice this administrative technology of recruitment. And this recruitment has involved a whole range of new arrangements that are quite often transnational, okay? Where there is a relationship that has been developed with some college or some educational provider that is local, where you can do one year of a, of a, of a degree from um, a Canadian or, or American or, or Australian universities as a way of ensuring that the supply line continues so that very student who does first and second year in Malaysia or Singapore or Hong Kong or China is then is ensured to be a your student for at least two years in their third and fourth year. As a result, these twinning arrangements, these articulation arrangements have been developed in relation to a logic of supply. It is ensuring the supply chains that is at the, funda at, at the fundamental premise upon which these practices have been developed. And of course, the practices of emergence of uh, practices in relation to regional educational hubs have a similar kind of character where uh, the institutions and countries have seen uh, some countries benefit, benefiting greatly commercially from uh, international education. So Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai, et cetera, et cetera, so South Africa have sought to develop regional educational hubs where they too can benefit from this industry that has been developed uh, over the years. And of course, they have been interested in regional and transnationalizing educational services. And educational services then are not only matters of education. They're, in other words, when they say educational services, they don't mean simply the services and the provision of curriculum and pedagogy and assessment practices. They also mean all the other paraphernalia that goes around these services, housing, travel, transport, uh, uh, ceremonies, um, uh, 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 basically networking and all those other services that are also become commodified. So a country like Australia, which brings in something of the order of um, seven or eight billion dollars in tuition, brings in three times as much in associated services. And all these things are then clustered under that broad category of educational services. So when, when people talk about educational, so, so, uh, in, uh, uh, educate, higher education industry or international education industry, they're not only talking about what goes on in the universities, they're also talking about what goes on 
within the community where these students live and uh, the kind of things that they purchase and the kind of uh, exchanges that take place in rental, in renting apartments, in, in, in going to the local shops and buying coffee and so on and so on. Those things have become part of educational services. So large number of uh, property investors have gone into the educational, international educational industry as a way of making profit and as a way of creating cheap accommodation for international students. And of course, the education has not been unaffected by this. And as a result, much of the education and higher education has been, has followed the perceptions of consumer demands. Assumption is that most of the people who are prepared to invest are going to invest in certain subjects and not other subjects. So those subjects where international education are not attracted to, to which they are not attracted to, are slowly do not have the same prestige as those subjects where there is large number of international students and who can become richer as a result of this. So as a result, 70% of international students in high Australian universities are in just three main areas of edu higher education, business studies, computer studies, and engineering, nearly three quarters. So basically what you are looking at is uh, uh, priorities of the subjects that are taught at universities are steered by perceptions of consumer demand rather than something that the universities think are subjects that are worth teaching, but uh, they decide on what should be taught and the faculties that should be appointed is uh, in terms of uh, the demands of the industry. And of course, this is applied to research networks as well. More and more research networks are being created so that out of those research networks, students can, uh, can, can, can be recruited and or where instrumental topics of research can be highlighted, which have some man monetary benefits. Education has also become a tool of public diplomacy. So it is argued that international education and the industry is not only good for universities, it is also good for the nation in strengthening the relationship between the country from where the international students come and the countries to which they go, give. So for example, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has invested a huge amount of money to ensure that the public diplomacy function of education are highlighted. Similarly, uh, they have uh, uh, the government, the Australian government, and indeed Canadian government and British government have increasingly seen higher education as being linked to the desire to migrate. So as a result, migration policy have affected recruitment practices and recruitment practices in turn have provided skilled migration that the country needs. So the nexus has become, it has emerged and it is a very complicated nexus. But nonetheless, it has become part of the industry of international education. So as a result, what we have seen is emergence of a new language of exporting educational services that is linked to a whole range of other things than simply education. Education has become, if you like, a minority part of all the other things, all the other activities that are now falling under the broad category of uh, 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 international education industry. Diplomacy, uh, migration, uh, housing, travel, um, uh, uh, retail, all of those things have been incorporated within, within the broader framework of uh, the industry. Now, who are the people who employ it? Uh, well, within universities, uh, there are a large number of people who are now employed that simply did not exist. When I first uh, started teaching at university in the early 1980s, there was nobody who was recruiting international students. Now there are universities that have as many as 100 to 150 employees who are part of an international recruitment office or international student support office. In other words, part of the industry. And of course, there are a large number of halls of residences that have emerged within the universities, often owned by the universities where students live, where 
basically economic exchange becomes part of um, their, their, their residence in, in a country where they go to. So what we are seeing is uh, employment of a huge range of people, not only outside university, but within university. These are the people who are employed by the university in order to support the industry and in order to help it grow and help it to find legitimation, if you like. And of course, once you've created a large group of people, they have been professionalized, okay? They, they see themselves not as educators and uh, not as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as administrators, but they see themselves as international educators, even though they have no direct say in what is taught and how it is taught, except to advise from some time to time as to what the market is looking for. Okay, that's actually their function. But they have become professionalized. And as a result, they hold these people, large conferences like NAFSA, for example, in the United States, uh, and uh, Aus uh, Association of International Education of Australia. In, uh, now the membership of these organizations and these professional association and what I call industry guilds is largely devoted to developing marketing skills and rewarding commercial innovations. In other words, they are not educators, but they are significantly part of the industry. And as a result, uh, what we see is uh, that they hold conferences and workshops uh, designed to make recruitment and, uh, and consumer support processes more efficient. In other words, these conferences, they, 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 they hold workshops. And as a result, Association of International Education in uh, Australia um, has just recently held a conference of, uh, of, uh, of around 3,000 people. And of that, 93% of these people were employed not as academics, but they were employed as international edu in international education offices. And their main business was to discuss the possibilities of international education, but in, in, in commercial terms, in terms of its commodification. If you like. So as a result, industries have demanded. Now, so what, has, what this has done is actually it has led to the emergence of a professional class of recruiter focused on the issues of uh, demand and supply uh, with only marginal interest in academic matters. Okay. Now, what are the consequences of this kind of commercialization? Well, to start off with, critical debates about the potential of the academic practices of internationalization have been marginalized. In other words, when the vice chancellor or when the, when the, when the director of an institution thinks about international education, then they invariably think about uh, the people who house international education offices rather than think about uh, uh, academics who may be interested in internationalization, such as myself, okay? In other words, those are the people who become on the top of the consciousness and their offices, of course, once you acquire an office and once you acquire a critical mass of people, then they themselves become an interest group with distinctive set of interests that are promoted in them. So industry begets industry and industry begets more internationalization. And that's basically what has happened over the years. Now, as a result, any critical research on the contradictions of neoliberal internationalization, such as that, that, that I do, or Sharon and uh, Sharon Stein and, and uh, Vanessa Ving, uh, uh, Andriotti do, are quite often dismissed as irrelevant. They don't say that it's, it's not important. They just say, it is not relevant to their work, their, 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 their performance indicators, their ways of thinking about internationalization. So what we are seeing here is an interesting kind of uh, division between those who are interested in internationalization as part of their academic work and those who are interested in as part of their commercial work. And this division has become stronger and stronger and wider and wider. So much so that the conversations across those two groups have become much more difficult to, 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 to sustain over a long period. Symbolically, they happen, but they happen only here and there. The core of the work of this professional class 
is not concerned with the content or the goals of pedagogy and curriculum and uh, practices of assessment. The core of this is it. So in other words, this is very difficult for them to even imagine as long as the product is well-defined and is happening in a reasonably coherent way. They're not interested in what goes inside the product. They're interested in selling the product in ways that are no different to selling a car. So for example, in, 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 con in, in construction of a car, there are those people who construct cars, they make, they work in factories. And then there are those people who work, work in the showrooms where they sell the car to the consumers. So what, you are, what I'm saying as an industry, as a car industry is divided into those parts, so has international education. There are those people who, uh, who sell education and those people who do international education. Now, what this has happened and what this is most relevant in, uh, most uh, evident in, is uh, in the ways in which uh, 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 the two classes of people uh, that are the academic internationalizers and the professional commercial internationalizers, if you like, are thinking about what might happen after COVID-19 uh, um, comes to an end and we go back to some kind of inverted commas normality. Both groups are thinking about these issues, but they're thinking about it in a radically different way. The commercial folks are thinking about how can we recover the student numbers that we lost all of a sudden in, uh, in March, 20, Mar March 2020, when all of a sudden many international students left and went back home and many of those students have not come back. So in Australia, something like 30% of the students have not come back. And uh, if you go to the professional recruiters, their main concern is what is it that we do to return those numbers? How it is that we can make sure that we go back to the numbers around 400,000 in, in, uh, in higher education that existed before March 2020 um, to in March, uh, in March 2022 or so on. So their concern is really about recovery of internet and student numbers. That's what they're preoccupied about. And understandably, because that is how they have constructed the industry. The industry has been concerned, concerned with the selling. They are the showrooms of the car selling equivalent. Okay, They are the people who show uh, and tell why it is a particular student should come to this university or that university. That's their professionalism. That's their talent. That's their skills. And that's what they are preoccupied. And that is their imaginary of internationalization as well. And that's what I call neoliberal imaginary. It is an imaginary that concerned with solving the problems in light of the logic of market rationality itself. Okay. In other words, uh, uh, while academics are talking about what are kind of new practices, new curriculums, and new pedagogies might be possible. Um, as a result, uh, when COVID comes to an end, these people are saying, how can we return to those numbers and perhaps even grow uh, in a few years' time? Even the possibilities of online learning are considered in terms of finding new markets and not in its pedagogic possibilities. I'm concerned about, uh, uh, as an academic, as to what kind of pedagogies can we now think about as normal pedagogies, having had experience of two years of teaching on the virtu in the virtual space. Okay, we have developed a whole range of innovations and we have turned and bought into online learning much more readily than many had anticipated. And yet lots of new practices have emerged. And some of us have started thinking about some of these practices being those that we can continue with even when COVID-19 and the pandemic is no longer a relevant factor. And that we can, we can, we can, we can change our pedagogies we can change our ways of interacting with students. Uh, we can change about the ways in which the teaching and learning processes take place. Those are my concerns. But the concerns of the commercial professional staff of international education is how do we use the online learning and think about its possibilities in creating new markets or at least returning some of the markets that have been lost. So can you see how the market thinking has become a dominant way in which the possibilities of internationalization are imagined 
by a dominant class of people who are employed to do nothing else but to do this. Whereas we are employed, academics are employed to think about all kinds of other things, our research, our teaching, our assessment, our, our meetings, our networks. And these people are basically employed to reimagine the possibilities of returning to the, the market size and perhaps creating new market. In this sense, in universities, market rationality has become triumphant with the failure to reimagine morally and culturally robust alternatives. So basically we have constructed an industry that does not have those skills, those ways of thinking about how we might imagine morally and culturally robust alternatives to commercialized and neoliberal forms of internationalization. Now that raises the possibility of what do we do? How do we proceed? Well, I have some ideas. To start off with, I think an understanding of new internationalization or another internationalization demands a clearer and more accessible articulation of the contradictions of market rationality as it is applied to international higher education. In other words, we need to show in an accessible language how this particular way of thinking about education has dire consequences, both for the students, for the universities, and perhaps for society much more largely. Now, how we do that is a very difficult question, but that we must do it is, uh, is something that I think uh, we cannot go beyond. We need to develop a new community of critical scholars who consider and debate alternatives that are both morally sound and practically feasible, okay? We need to actually understand that uh, we cannot simply articulate uh, abstract metaphysical propositions of internationalization and metaphysical uh, uh, normative conceptions, but we need to actually show them to be practically feasible. Now, how you bring those two things together is not all that clear and all that easy, largely because there are a set of people who are only concerned with practicality. And there are a set of people who are only concerned with morality. How do you bring them together becomes a major challenge. Need to make sure that the field of international, uh, international education is not left unchallenged uh, to, the, to the commercially oriented principles. In other words, uh, I think we have made the mistake uh, of, uh, of allowing this group to grow and grow and grow and become more powerful. And by not engaging with them, we have allowed them to remain unchallenged to their assumptions. And I think somehow or other, we must find ways of, uh, of, of, of challenging. We need to develop alliances with scholars who are also critical of market rationality in other fields of endeavor, uh, research, teaching, et cetera, et cetera, and its oversized impact on higher education. In other words, we have to talk about those people who are not necessarily interested in international education, but nonetheless are concerned about the market rationality and its oversized impact on, uh, on higher education. And we need to uh, focus on those epistemic virtues, as I've called them, associated with cosmopolitan learning. How, how, how in another internationalization is not only desirable, but perfectly feasible. Now these are huge challenges and I don't think they will be easily resolved because uh, um, um, from my perspective, we have taken the ball, uh, eye off the ball, okay? And as a result, a class of people have emerged who have become very, a managerial class of people have emerged who have become very powerful and their interest is as much in redefining education and higher, higher education in their terms as it is our interest in defining international, edu international education in our terms. In other words, two competing modalities of internationalization have now become, if you like, uh, um, uh, uh, become evident in, uh, in the spaces of higher education. Uh, they're not necessarily equal. Uh, they are not necessarily central, but nonetheless, uh, my own hunch is that uh, unless we do something about it, then the tension across those two groups is only likely to grow. Thank you very much.